Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. Joining me, as always, the prince of Twitter, the regent of redstate.com, uh, Andrew Malcolm at AH Malcolm on Twitter. We never call it X, we always call it Twitter. That's and, right. Uh, <laughs> Forever in our hearts, Twitter. Forever in our hearts. And of course, the big story is that neither one of our teams made it after they passed the first round of the playoffs. <laughs> yeah 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 you know what? i was i was on a call with i was on a call with you hewitt and you know it, it's sort of an off the record call but i think i can relate this story nobody will care and i made a comment about football about the fact that i was pessimistic about the steelers chances and you said i thought we were going to talk about football <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was embarrassing. That was embarrassing. And the coach made it clear that our savior this year is gone. Joe Flacco is history. They're going to they're going to stick know, with with the strange person. Oh, Deshaun Watson. Yeah, you know, I got to give credit to Joe Flacco though. Isn't he had a hell of, he had a hell of a short season there? And yeah, I mean, he didn't have a good playoff game, right? He threw two pick sixes. Yeah. Um, but I mean, they wouldn't even been there if it hadn't been for Joe Flacco. Oh, they would have was... off. That's right. They would have had a losing record. He's he was amazing. He came in, gave everybody stability on the Browns, and um, and he was, you know, he was a pro and class uh, act, total class and, act the whole way. And all every time somebody was complimenting him, he was turning it around and giving credit to his teammates and the coach and whatever. So. But in typical fashion, the Browns um, diss their good people. Well, I mean, they've got Watson. They spent a lot of money on Watson. They've got. Well, that doesn't mean guy. he's any good. He hasn't. He has. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know why they spent the money on Deshaun Watson? Baker Mayfield, by the way, is having a hell of a is having a hell of a that, career. Isn't that fun? I'm in, I'm enjoying that. That and I can watch him in Kansas City as long as they can last. I'm yeah, not I'm sure. a, I'll see who is that? Oh, yeah. No, I think the Bills will take the Bucks. And who does Kansas City play now? Uh, Kansas City. You know, I think Kansas City goes to um, the Bills. Actually, they play in Buffalo. Oh, next. okay. Um, no. Tampa Bay. I think um, Tampa Bay's NFC, right? So uh, Tampa Bay. Oh, that's right. Yes, of course. Tampa Bay is going to play like Baltimore uh, or somebody. Well, Baltimore's AFC. I forget who's playing Baltimore. Oh, I'm all screwed up here. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. But I mean, we haven't seen Baltimore yet in the playoffs. I mean, they, those guys were those guys were absolutely killing it during the season. So they've had a week off. Well, let's see if that's if that's tempered yeah. them a bit. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not I'm betting kinda, against I'm, Baltimore. I'm looking forward to it. It would have been more fun with the Browns, but uh, I mean, with all of their injuries, and then Flacco comes in cold. And uh, just as a, a great uh, job, you know, he's going to be playing next year, right? And he's going to, somebody's going to pick the guy up because oh, he's still got to. an arm. And I mean, he may not be a starter, but he's going to season up some rookie or some second year guy and, and be there on the bench in case, in, in case he's needed. Um, and he's going to make a decent amount of money doing it after this, after this season, you know, the same thing with Steelers and Mason Rudolph. Right. I mean, there's there's going to be a there's going to be a competition in camp next year between him and Kenny Pickett because Mason Rudolph played really well. And, um, you know, he wasn't really the, the reason why they got in a 21 to nothing hole yesterday in, in the playoff game, but he almost led them out of it. I mean, he was yeah. he was pretty I love that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I love so. But I mean, well, if he doesn't catch on there, Mason Rudolph's going to end up someplace else and might even end up being a starter. So, yeah, um, that's disappointing. So, um, anyway, um, that's not the playoffs that everybody wants to talk about, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so we want to talk so, about the playoffs in Iowa. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. You know, Iowa has always underwhelmed me um, as an as an indicator. I think our primary system is cockamamie, totally cockamamie. And and it makes no sense to have Iowa, New Hampshire uh, play 
uh, such important roles in setting the tone for selecting a presidential candidate. It's just, there's nothing, I mean, New Hampshire is just strange. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I don't put much truck in, in, in Iowa. I mean, of course, now that Trump won, he's, he's putting truck in there, but if if they were, if Iowa was so important, we'd have President uh, Huckabee and President Cruz and President and, uh, Gephardt. President yeah. Gephardt on the other side. President you know, Gephardt, yeah. yeah you know, like, normally, I would say that if you've got a, a you know pretty close, evenly distributed um, caucus in Iowa that one person just happened to be in front of, I'd say don't put too much stock into that because of that very thing. But when you've yeah. got somebody who comes in there and they're thirty points ahead of the next person up. Yeah. And and they didn't even oh, no. really bother to campaign much in Iowa to get there. Well, I mean, I think time, this is yeah. yeah. This this time Trump paid attention and it's good that he did because he would have been embarrassed otherwise. Uh, but Iowa is a great place. I love Iowa. I've had so many flat tires there, I can't believe it. But <laughs> uh, uh, but I'm just not sure that Iowa and New Hampshire are the best choices to uh to to kick off and and it's not just kicking off it's receiving you know i mean they just i don't know they're they're great places but they're not they shouldn't be in a position such a powerful position they're not representative but then again no, that's right but, but i mean i don't necessarily want new york or california in that position both of no, both no. Of which would be both of which would be much more representative, right? In terms of, you know, population, just population size. But you know what Iowa and New Hampshire force candidates to do, or usually yes, traditionally force candidates, yep. is to engage voters very personally, you know? And, yep. yeah. and, and, and on subjects that they're not used to, like ethanol and, uh, well, what was it before? the What was the, those pills that... Um, that were wreaking such havoc in New Hampshire. Fentanyl? Yeah. It was, a, was it fentanyl? I thought there was some pills. But anyway, yes, to get involved in local issues and to learn how to learn on the fly. And that's a good test. That's a good test. Uh, I just, um, it's just too much power in, in unrepresentative places. You know, and it's fine. I don't really... I like I like the fact that, there, that there's a couple of that there's a couple of smaller states, smaller venues that that lead this process off because otherwise it's really just a media blitz. And I think in this in this particular cycle, it's good to see what happens when you are dealing in places where it's traditionally more grassroots. Yeah. And and because when we get into the big media states, I mean Donald Trump is really going to have a huge advantage there in those big media states. Um, you no, know, what's really going to be fun in New Hampshire, I have to say, is the Democrat primary. Now, <laughs> e Joe Biden either forgot to register or decided I'll diss New Hampshire and I won't register because he thought South Carolina was going to be first. So he made South Carolina first. And then New Hampshire said, uh, no, we're going first. <laughs> so there will be what I think about nine or 10 days of Dean Phillips spanking the president incumbent Joe Biden uh, before we get to uh, South Carolina. Um, yeah. I mean, so look, uh, I think that we're probably looking at a rematch here. I mean, I don't see you know, Nikki Haley's going to compete a little bit better in New Hampshire. Ron DeSantis isn't going to do as well in New Hampshire. He's going to go there and campaign, but he's not really a, he's not really a New Hampshire kind of candidate. New ha Haley's much more the profile there. Yeah. So Haley's probably going to come in second, but she's not going to, she's not going to beat Donald Trump in New Hampshire. And I think that, I mean, that's what this shows. It, it's too early to do the full takeaway, right? But if you're looking at what happened in Iowa, and again, where Donald Trump didn't do a ton of campaigning personally, he had his people out there, but he wasn't doing a ton of personal campaigning out there, yeah. is I think that what you're dealing with now, and I think this is more clear, 
is you've got incumbency weight on both sides of the uh, both sides of the election. Yeah, it's like two incumbents running against each other. Yeah. It is definitely. And and look, you're not going to dislodge Biden off the ticket by having Dean Phillips run against him. You're not even going to dislodge him off the ticket if you had somebody like Josh Shapiro run against him or Gretchen Whitmer run against him, neither of whom are going to do that. Um, or Roy Cooper or Gavin Newsom, maybe the Gavin Newsom's an even better uh, example because Gavin Newsom has been flirting with that idea, obviously, for months and decided not to do it. And the reason why is you're not going to push an incumbent president off the ticket. And I think Donald Trump is for a very large number of Republicans, the incumbent. Yeah. Um, and you're just, we, you just simply can't push, excuse me, push him off the ticket. And I think that that's what yesterday was about. And I think that's what it demonstrates. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. The little wrinkle for Republicans in New Hampshire is that independents can vote there. And I think, yeah. uh, and Democrats could register as independent independents. Now they could try to cause havoc. And then we I mean, John McCain focused on New Hampshire in 2000 and spanked George W. Bush, um, really well. I, I speak from personal experience. I was working for George W. Bush at the time and, uh, Carl Rove and I were sitting at breakfast on election day of the New Hampshire primary and the first exit polls came in and Carl looked, looked at them and he said, uh, not good. <laughs> and it got even worse than not good. I think it was uh, 18 or 19 points McCain beat him. Uh, but McCain focused on independence which I'm not sure that's a good measure of who Republicans want. And in the end, it wasn't John McCain in 2000. And then the Republicans followed their, okay, next man up in 2008, and it was McCain. But um, I think Haley will appeal to in, in independents and turncoat Democrats in, um, in New Hampshire. So she may do uh, pretty well there. Yeah, I think she'll do well. I mean, I don't think she's going to embarrass herself. She didn't embarrass herself in Iowa. She came in third, but it was a, you know, it was just. I like the idea. I like the idea of Nikki Haley. I do. Uh, I, I like the idea. I liked the idea of Nikki Haley, but I think on the campaign trail, I've learned to like it a lot less. Um, <laughs> and I'd still be fine if she was the nominee. I'd, I'd happily vote for her if she was the nominee. But I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm not as impressed with Nikki Haley as when this process started. But, but you know, the polls consistently have shown her doing better against Biden than any yeah. of the other Republicans. So well, the reason why is because she's she you know, she's not as far. She's not as much a conservative. She, she's not crazy. She's not out of the loop. And um, she doesn't she doesn't scare people who would like to be sort of conservative. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I guess uh, it's, you know, it's not like you and I can control it. Although we'll try. Yeah, we'll, we'll certainly give it a <laughs> shot. So I want to ask you about the media uh, yesterday, because I actually was a little surprised by how fast the Associated Press and the oh, other yeah. networks oh. called this. But I wasn't shocked, right? Because I kind of understand the process. But I mean, it became this huge thing. You know, Ron DeSantis accused the the, the Fox News, you know, as well as the Associated Press and the other networks of election interference. That was the phrase that he used was election. Well, interference. He's got a he's got a point. And it was reminiscent of 2000 with um, declaring Gore the winner in Florida before the panhandle polls had closed. Yeah, uh, yeah. That, uh, that I mean, I agree that one was egregious. Yeah. Uh, I think this is and, different. Well, this is a little bit different, but the principle is the same. It's an it's not um, it's not like they're going to count votes at the end of the of. It's not like counting votes. It's something that's unfolding. Yeah, and I don't think they made it clear that. Early returns suggest a big win for Donald Trump. It was oh, they, called, Trump. they just called the race. Yeah, they yeah, just called exactly yeah. called the race, which could very well uh, 
determine whether people went. You know, the the turnout was down considerably. Well, no, because and this is the no, thing about was, caucuses. But, I know the, I, I know the turnout was down. Yeah. But in order to vote in the caucus, you had to show up at seven o'clock because yeah. they close the doors at that point and they have to count for quorums. They have to figure out what the quorum is so that they know how many votes there are in the hall. These yeah. calls didn't come in until 730. Those doors were locked. Nobody else was going to go. I mean, the turnout was already there. The complaint well, nobody that I had heard, a phone. <laughs> yeah, that was the complaint I heard was that, oh, well, you know, they're getting these text alerts saying Fox News has called the race for for yeah. Donald Trump. But I mean, I don't see that as I mean, I, I, I'm I, just well, like, yeah, I'm just arguing for a phrasing. It yeah. was it was clear from the polls that Donald Trump is going to win. The question is by how much and who's second. Uh, it was well, clear from the entrance poll apparently too, because yeah. there were two there were two different firms doing entrance polls, and the, but they the didn't qualify. They didn't qualify. Donald Trump won. Yeah, and and that's like okay, I'm going home. Um, I I I liken uh, caucus meetings to. Uh, endless PTA meetings, which, which, so true. which I, which I gave up. I mean, I went to, I went to a few PTA meetings and that, Oh my God, no thanks. And, uh, it's, it's, it, you know, if you were there with your wife, you would go, you would be looking at each other. Like really? It's, oh my it's, people, the people who haven't attended a caucus have no idea how petty and and boring these things actually are when you get to the point where the surrogates start standing up and and delivering their pitches it's actually kind of interesting but there's there's some work that gets well, you were there me. you were there i was there in iowa in two in 2012 and i was also part of the caucus process in minnesota because they have a caucus they still do they caucus and that's um that's the that's the process by which the presidential endorsement comes through. Um, for statewide offices, they also caucus, but they can also they also hold primaries. So it's a it's a weird hybrid system there. But the presidential endorsement comes through the caucus system, and and I went all the way to the state convention as a oh, delegate that year. Oh, Ed, that's why you're bald. It is. I mean, <laughs> I sat through some of these meetings, and I mean, oh. before you even get to the point. You have to listen to everybody bitch about everybody else in the room, because the thing that you find out about this is that everybody's got grudges in the room against somebody else in the room. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> At least in Minnesota, that was the case. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, uh, all evening on a folding chair in a church basement is, is one of the most uncomfortable <laughs> experiences you'll ever have. Those folding chairs were not meant for human butts. It was it was not good. Yeah, that's the reason why you bring a heavy coat so you can fold it underneath you. Yeah, when you yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, you know, people ask me. People, people ask me, um, well, how would you like to join our organization? The first thing I always ask is, do you have meetings? Oh yes. Then never mind. <laughs> <laughs> never mind. I'm busy. Well, we haven't told it when we're meeting yet. No, nah, I'm. Doesn't busy. matter. <laughs> <laughs> you remember, have you have you seen that 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 meme where they well it was there was one during COVID where they asked this man close up on his face and they said, okay, so now that there's a quarantine, um, you have two choices: a spend the entire quarantine with your wife and kids, or b and the guy says b. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what it. I don't care what it is. I'm taking it. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. So. Um, so anyway, yes. I'm not sure it's going to change. Uh, Iowa is going to change much in New Hampshire. Uh, I mean, Trump is obviously ahead, and there's going to be something has to happen. Uh, yeah, I don't, think, I don't think I'm. I mean, that's next week. It's next Tuesday. That's a primary, so people are going to go to the polls, cast a ballot, and we'll the polls will close at I think eight p.m. or something like that, and after that we'll we'll get the, the vote counts. It's not going to be a caucus, but I kind of think that even with crossovers, Trump is probably going to be. Oh, he'll uh, win. It's just a yeah. question of, of uh, how how close second. 
second is. Um, yeah, I think the next real test is South Carolina because that's Nikki. That's Nikki's home state. Yeah, yeah. But it's also a big, huge, you know, conservative exactly. populist electorate there, which yeah. is going to be very, very friendly to Donald Trump. And I with, with a lot that. of evangelicals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't. I just. I know that's Nikki's home state. I don't see Nikki doing um, big business down there. And, and, and Ron DeSantis isn't going to do big business there either. I think he's, he's going to campaign down there. Well, here's the question that I want to throw at you, because I'm hearing this now from different people. Is that, all right, DeSantis really needs to get out. DeSantis more than Haley. Haley's at least a contrast. DeSantis is basically the Trump agenda without Trump. That was the pitch, right? <laughs> Which is you know, basically the Ted Cruz 2015 strategy. Well, I'm, I'm Donald Trump without the, without the craziness, right? And that was sort of, Ron DeSantis was, I'm going to be Donald Trump without the baggage. Yeah. Do you see Ron DeSantis getting out before Super Tuesday? Because I don't think anybody gets out other than, you know, Asa Hutchinson and Vivek Ramaswamy. I don't think either Haley or DeSantis get out before Super Tuesday. No, I think they're in, They've got a constituency that expects them to go all the way, and they'd look like a quitter um, if they gave up um, before it was overwhelmingly obvious that they weren't going to win. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and Super Tuesday is what, March 3rd or March? Yeah, March. It's the first week of March. Super Tuesday is the first week. I think there's a mini Tuesday sometime in February. Yeah. But the Super Tuesday is is the first week of March, and I don't see anybody getting out before then. You know, Marco Rubio. That's my, March fifth. Yeah. Yeah, Marco Rubio got out in in twenty sixteen, just after Super Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, and he, I mean, and he won Minnesota though. So I mean, at least he had a state. You know, if if, if Ron DeSantis actually wins a state, then maybe six in longer than that. But I don't. I I, I just don't see in this particular situation where there are significant issues around Donald Trump, his legal issues, his age. Um, I think that both Haley and DeSantis are thinking they're going to stick it out as long as possible so that in case you need a plan B, they're the, they're the two people who are going to be yeah. Yeah. Uh, buying for yeah. it. Exactly. I agree with you. Uh, oh boy, what a mess. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's good for everybody to have a choice, but uh, I, there's a sense, you know, I don't have documentation on this, but there's a sense that I get of, of serious national unease. Um, and I think it's primarily with the president who doesn't know what day it is, but uh, all of the other turmoil. And it's interesting, Ed, and, uh, 2024 has become, and I, I wrote about this a few weeks ago, and I think we talked about it, the deja vu. 2024 is sort of the mirror image of 2020. In 2020, we had Donald Trump, the incumbent, who was doing some outrageous and tumultuous things, and it was very fresh in their memory. And the alternative seemed to be Joe Biden, who there were signs of his mental troubles then, but uh, people look past them. Uh, and he seemed to be sort of a return to the old a transition guy. And this is the way he pitched himself, a transition guy. We get back to normalcy. And, and it didn't turn out that way. And he turned out to be a crazy left. And now we have Donald Trump, and memories have eased somewhat on the chaos that comes with him. And he seems to be the, maybe not preferable, but the logical alternative to a president who's um, lost. Yeah. I, yeah. I saw a three minutes video the other day of a collection of Joe Biden's confusions. And it is, it's so depressing. I mean, this it's, is, yeah, this, it's this scary. Is el it's elder abuse is what it is that for them yep. to put him out. I mean, he's <laughs> lost on stage and, and his wife has to come and take him by the hand or show him where to go next. Uh, he, it's just, it's, it's painful. Uh, I wouldn't want 
uh, my dad going going through that. That's just it's cruel. No, but again, you got the the weight of incumbency here. Yeah, I mean, oh, and it's yeah. not like the running mate is a good option. Kamala Harris is terrible, and everybody knows yeah. that Kamala Harris is terrible. She she's works. hiding out yeah. in Los Angeles these days because she's getting flack from both Republicans and Democrats about how mm-hmm. incompetent she is. So there's no there's no solution here other than to do the weekend at Bernie's with Joe Biden and drag him across the finish line <laughs> one more time. Oh, well, you know, it, the only way out, is, I agree with you totally, but the only way out, it seems, is to either feign or find some a medical condition uh, that uh, for the good of the country and so on, that Joe Biden willingly or seemingly willingly uh, steps aside, but then they're stuck with her. So uh, it's a mess and they, they create, he created this by picking her. Um, right. It was the first we were, First yeah. of his incompetent decisions. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, anyway, it's, anyway. Uh, it's, it's sad. Well, we're going to have to wrap things up here in just a minute because... Well, I don't you know. know if I have any new jokes. I might have some... I, I've, got, I've got at least one. You, you go. All right. So this Canadian uh, lumber company is advertising that they're looking for a, a, a good experienced lumberjack. The very next day, the skinny little tiny guy shows up with a jack, <laughs> knocks on the lumberjack's door. And the head lumberjack takes one look at him and says, get out of here. And the guy says, no, no, just give me a chance. Give me a chance. And, he's, and the, the foreman says, all right, well, you know, you see that giant redwood over there? Take your axe and go cut it down. He figures he's never going to see this guy again. Five minutes later, the skinny little guy is back and says, hey, I cut the tree down. And the foreman can't believe it. He goes running out there and he says, where did you learn to do that? And he says, the little guy says, well, you know, I did a lot of work in the Sahara forest. And the, and the foreman says, you mean the Sahara desert? He says, well, that's what they call it now. <laughs> you know, I guess prehistorically, it was a forest. Probably, yeah. I'm sure it was, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's what they call it now. <laughs> they call it now. <laughs> okay. Well, there's an old one that uh, they, uh, it was Jay Leno who said, um, uh, boy, these winter storms are playing havoc with, uh, with the electrical grid all across the country. It's as if Barack Obama took it over. <laughs> then there's there's a north dakota joke so we can get into that uh <laughs> north dakota jokes montana the category. <laughs> yeah there's a whole category of north dakota jokes in montana they tell them all the time uh where uh the north dakota businessman had to fly um had to fly out of state and uh, so he got in the car and he was driving to the airport and he came to this T intersection and the sign said airport left. So he turned around and went home. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's one other one, North Dakota joke, where a Montana farmer uh, is putting in fences and a guy shows up and he says, I got a crew of North Dakota guys to uh, help you uh, put in miles of fences. He said, okay, great. So uh, they have breakfast and the whole, both crews head out and dinner time comes and the Montana crew comes in <clears throat> and they said, uh, the foreman says, well, we got, we got 142 fence posts in today. And the rancher said, oh, that's great. Thanks very much. So they hold dinner, but then the North Dakota guys never showed. So they ate dinner and along about nine o'clock, the North Dakota crew shows in and the North Dakota foreman comes in and get a meal and and Montana guy says, wow, you guys put in a long day. And he said, yeah, well, we did a pretty good job. He says, how many fence posts did you get? And he said, nine. Nine? (laughs) He said, yeah, nine. And he said, the Montana guys did 142. And the North Dakota guy says, yeah, we saw them, but they're only halfway in.
<laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right, I got one more for you. And you're going to like this. This is a George W. Bush joke. Okay. It's not It's not even a George. I mean, it's not a, it, it, it's not yeah, making that's George okay. W. Bush. That's it's, okay. It's, it's, it's a George it's W. Bush joke. A quarter of a century. So, so George W. Bush is going through an airport, right? And as he's walking past this one gate, he sees this man with the long white hair and a long flowing beard in robes. And he's carrying two stone tablets. And he does a double take and he looks around. He, he walks up to the guy and says, excuse me, aren't you Moses? And the guy turns away and ignores him. So George W. Bush goes around to the other side and tries to get the guy, you know, look in the guy's eyes. He says, aren't you Moses? And the guy looks up at the ceiling. He says, look, man, are you Moses or not? And then the guy sighs and he says, yeah, I'm Moses. And so George W. Bush says, why didn't you answer me when I first asked you? He says, because the last time I spoke to a bush, I ended up in the desert for 40 years. <laughs> Rim shot. But I'm bummed. All right. Well, that's our podcast for this week. <laughs> the, I'm sorry, the regent of redstate.com, the prince of Twitter. Andrew Malcolm at A.H. Malcolm. We didn't even get to your columns this week. You had some great columns over at redstate.com. Go check those out, folks. We'll talk more about his columns next week, though, uh, when we are um, griping about what's going to happen in New Hampshire that same day. But hey, we're going <laughs> to we're going to have a we're going to have a great podcast for you then. Andrew, thanks so much for being with me today. Thank you, Ed. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. <laughs>